Hello everyone. Last week, we began the story of Leish and the Thunder King, in which we saw a single Mogu rise up from the flames of war, steal the power of its creators, and forge a massive empire. His downfall came in the lands of Uldum, where the Tolvir used the Forge of Rich Nation to wipe out Leishen, the Zandalar that came with him, basically the might of his empire. His body was recovered and enshrined within the Tomb of Conquerors, waiting for the day that the Zandalari would recover enough to come back and resurrect him. In the meantime, with the Thunder King gone and new Mogul Emperors rising up, the Pandaren saw their chance to rise up as well and rebel against their slavers. They were still forbidden to touch a weapon, so instead they learned how to use their own bodies to fight. The art of the monk, it spread far and wide across the lands. The many races of Pandaria banded together and overthrew the Mogu masters. This gave way for a brand new empire. One built on the principles of justice, wisdom and benevolence. Yet the Zandalari they had not forgotten about a promised piece of land that Lei Shen was supposed to give them. Figuring that the Pandaren were not really likely to uphold their bargain, and knowing that they were strong enough to overthrow the Mogu, the trolls decided to invade Pandaria and take the land by force. Our Pandaren friends were in quite a panic over this. They didn't exactly hold a standing army. Luckily, one amongst them, Jang, she had tamed a cloud serpent. Its aerial abilities it brought them the advantage they needed to turn the tide of war. Soon enough, more followed her example. The Order of the Cloud Serpents rose up and took the sky. It forced the trolls to play their final card, their final tactic, resurrecting the Thunder King. He would surely have the power to purge the troublesome serpent riders, destroy any army on the ground. A pitched battle, it erupted near the Tomb of Conquerors, where Jang was forced to sacrifice herself in a final, desperate attack, which killed the Zandalari leader. The other Zandalari soon broke ranks and fled back to their homeland in shame. Through her heroic acts, Lei Shen's resurrection was postponed, and Pandaria entered a time of relative peace. Helped quite a bit by the Emperor Xiao Hao, who knew of the coming of the Legion. He was aware that the War of the Ancients was about to play out, and to defend his people, he became one with the land, hiding Pandaria in the mist. This act would keep them hidden from the world for millennia, and the threat of the Thunder King it remained contained within its tomb. Fast forward to the expansion Mist of Pandaria, as with the Cataclysm, these mystical mists, they vanished around the land, and is discovered by the Alliance and the Hordes. They are bringing quite a bit of warfare to these peaceful lands, which is enough of a problem on its own. But in Pandaria it becomes extra bad. When those bits and pieces of Yashiraj fell back into the planet, it infused this piece of land with the Sha, a force that feeds on negative emotions. So our coming here, it brings about a whole bunch of problems. Problems that we need to clean up. A brand new land though, brand new resources, new people and weaponry to discover. This is great fuel for the war efforts between the Alliance and the Hordes. But they're not the only ones who find out about this recently rediscovered land. The Zandalari, guided by Prophet Zul, they've come to collect what was promised so long ago. Now they need it more than ever, as the Cataclysm, it caused their beautiful Zandalar to sink into the ocean. At least, that's the story that they tried to sell back then. Zul, he kinda exaggerated the damage, considering, you know, Zandalar is still there. But all the same, the trolls are desperate for a new piece of land, and work hard to bring back their old ally, the Thunder King. They find his body in the tomb, and bring it back to the Isle of Reckoning, where Prophet Karzul performed the ancient ritual. Despite heroes doing their very best to stop this, the ritual is finally a success. After millennia of waiting, the Thunder King, he walks the land once more. Pandaria, her hills of gold, in dark and mournful times of old, did once a hopeless horror hold. When from her sacred veil did spring, with storm and flash, a monstrous thing, his name, Lei Shen, the Thunder King. His thunder boomed across the land, and none who dared and fought could stand against the Iron Tyrant's hands. A palace grand, a warm domain, such mighty works born of his reign, built by slaves, their hearts in chains. But seasons change and tyrants die. His fury spent in times gone by. The thunder slept beneath Kunlai. Secure the remains, brothers. By Sandalari hands, he has been taken. 
by Zandalari boys. He has a weekend. Gathers his new Zandalari allies, as well as the Mogul troops ever loyal to their king, and they make base within the Throne of Thunder on the Isle of Thunder, an isle most believed to be a legend. Few even knew that it was real, but there it is, where unending storms roar and split the heavens. Here it is, where we see the alliance and horde gather their forces to assault the Thunder King in his home. They're not exactly working with each other. Jaina Proudmoore, she's pissed off at the hordes because she lost her home to the bombing of Fedamore and the betrayal with the Divine Bell. On the other hand, we have Lord from Arfaran, who's pissed off at Jaina, the purged Daladan, murdered and imprisoned their people just because they were used by Garrosh to steal this Divine Bell. An artifact of great power, one of many that War Chief Garrosh was looking for. In the 117th year of the Thunder King's reign, the Kroon Spellweavers approached Lei Shen with their greatest creation. A bell caused from the Maker's flesh, shaved by star's fire and bound by the breath of darkest shadow. This bell, when rung, it could shake the world and call to the heavens. Taken to war, the bell's cacophonous tones, it stirred the heart of Lei Shen's warriors. It fueled their hatred and anger, lending them strength on the field of battle. The bell's screaming voice it struck fear and doubt in the hearts of the Emperor's enemies, sending them fleeing in his paw. Awed by its power, the Thunder King described the instrument as the voice of the gods, and he named it Shen King, also known as the Divine Bell. Caused from the Maker's flesh, to the Mogu there could only be one Maker, the Keeper chained up by Lei Shen, but we'll get to that in a moment. So the Divine Bell was sought out by the Alliance and the Hordes. The Alliance got there first and decided to hide away from the Hordes. In turn, the Horde they used the connections in Daladan to steal the bell for the Warchief, which led to the purge in Daladan. It's thanks to Anduin Rin that the Divine Bell could not be used by Garrosh in this war. He did try to master its powers, but Anduin, he discovered the Harmonic Mallet, which was created by the Pandaren to counter the bell to turn his echoes of chaos into perfect harmony. In his rage, Garrosh smashed all the bones in Anduin's body, together with the bell. He'd find other ways of empowering his forces, like finding the heart of Yashiraj. But that, in a nutshell, is why the Alliance and Hordes are not exactly friendly with each other. While messing with the other sides, they do focus on assaulting the Isle of Thunder. Step by step, they take on the forces of the Zandalari and the Thunder King, carving out a path to the Throne of Thunder, and even picking up some of the Pandaren wisdom along the way. It ends today! Here, the cycle ends when you, Regent Lord, and you, Lady Proudmoore, Turn from one another and walk away. Jaina and Lorfmar decide to turn away from each other and focus on the threat of Garrosh instead. We still have the Thunder King to deal with though, waiting inside of his seat of power. And going straight through the door, that's going to be challenging, as Nalak guards the walls of his hidden citadel. At some point, Lei Shen discovered a rare clutch of thundering cloud serpents, and he set to subjugating them. The largest hatchling fiercely resisted. And when Lei Shen visited the handling pens, he laughed mightily at the charred mogu that lined the walls. He took this hatchling for his own, and for his obedience granted its power over the storms and the sky. For thousands of years following the death of the Thunder King, Nalak has remained ever dutiful and will strike out at any that dare to approach. With our Pandaren allies, we've secured another way to get into the throne, where, even after he died, great swaths of corrupted energy lingered. Now, the resurrected Thunder King and the Zandalari Trolls, they intend to harness that energy to establish the reign of Lei Shen once again. Best to not let that happen, and the raid shows us the power this ancient old allegiance has granted Lei Shen. First up is Jinrock the Breaker. The Thunder King, give me power! <laughs> Come 
I'll show you. When the Thunder King awoke, he rewarded the most loyal and ambitious Zandalari trolls with power beyond their wildest dreams. The berserker Jinrok was one of the first to receive the king's blessing. And even though Lei Shen gifts nearly tore his body apart, the troll is now capable of calling the fury of the storm in battle. How you beat me. His seat of power is looking a little bit tarnished. But then again, our home, it wouldn't look ready for guests either if we've been dead for millennia. Over the bridge we go, where trolls patrol the sky, and a mighty storm is trying to push us off to an unfortunate early demise. Good memories here, of rape members just unable to get across this part. Not until the ads have been killed and the storm has vanished. Next up is Horodon, who does not come alone. Welcome, weaklings, to the rebirth of the Zondolari Empire! The color the Chuka Horodon! Kalamaste! The Zandalari brought powerful creatures with them to the Isle of the Thunder King to use as engines of war. Led by the war god Jalak, the Dinomancers of the Zandalari Beast Ward use ancient tribal magics to strengthen the great beast and command obedience. The horns of Horodon, the fabled mount of Jalak himself, it can tear through the stone walls of a keep as a blade cuts through silk. And from the gates, different tribes of troll that we faced in the past they appear. It's kind of cool to see that the unification that was started back in the Cataclysm with the badass cinematic in which Vol'jin, he walks away from the offer to join them, it also plays his part here in the next expansion. The trolls go all out trying to claim a new home, but we can turn the dinosaur against them to seal off the gates, until as Yalak, he has no choice but join the fight as well. The color Karosti, Hododon, destroy them! Together they go down, and we go onwards towards a familiar face. Got a Shell Spirit Binder, he makes his return. We fought him before in the Mogushan vaults, where Gadajal was ordered by Zul to break in, discover any weapons or secrets they might be able to add to the Zandalari might. The vaults were built and expanded upon by Lei Shen when he got into power. It contains and protects its secrets, many of the Empire's lost artifacts, and it's the resting place of the spirits of old Mogu kings. Gadajal and his forces, they didn't get very far into the place as we too visited the vaults. Together with Lorewalker Cho, we delved deep into Mogul history and we uncovered that this is the location of the engine of Nalashka. The one which held the power that Lei Shen and his followers had used in the past to shape flesh and stone into brand new living creatures. Cho dares not to think what damage such a machine would cause to Pandaria. We had to destroy it and its protectors. Stone soldiers who've been motionless for centuries, now awakened by our entry. With the final fight against the will of the Emperor, Zinzi and Zhanzi, some of Lei Shen's mightiest creations. But back in the Throne of Thunder, Garajal already told us that to him, death is merely a doorway and time is a window. He is back now, resurrecting the fallen that we slay, until we reach the Council of Elders. Lei Shen, let us prove to you the might of the Zandalari. We will crush these intruders where they stand. We will never fail you. Drakari. Faraki, Amani, and Gurubashi. Here they make their stand with the promise of an unstoppable empire. Garajal even empowers them during the encounter, which makes their already formidable abilities quite deadly, but not even that is enough to bring that glorious future that they envisioned to be a reality. You have swept the filth from my doorstep. Perhaps you are worthy of my attention. But your trespass ends here. None may enter my forbidden stronghold. I shall rebuild this bridge with your bones for bricks. Looks like Lei Shen isn't quite ready to see us yet. The bridge is destroyed and we're sent to the underbelly of the palace. With a couple of creatures, they've made themselves quite at home. Creatures like Tortos, for example. Over the millennia, small amounts of Mogu flesh-shaping magic, it seeped into the caverns below the Thunder King Citadel. Dark energies warped one of the chamber's native dragon turtles, melding it to the surrounding crystalline walls. Known as Tortos, this amalgamation of flesh and stone, it has since feasted on the cave's rich mineral deposits and grown to a colossal size. So large, in fact, that it now blocks our path forward and has to be destroyed. Its skin will spin into battle, which could cause quite a bit of trouble for the raids, but also used to kick back at Tortos and stop his casting. 
Now, I never really noticed this before, but his death animation is just shattering into little pieces. Knowing its story now, a nice little detail. Forward we go into the forgotten depths, where we have to ring three of the Mogu bells to awaken Magera. Even the most callous amongst the Mogu quaver at the thought of the dark experiments performed at the Thunder King's behest. Long ago, a young cloud serpent was twisted in a multi-headed hydra and left to languish between Leishan's throne. Now the twisted creature lurks deep in the forgotten depths, awaiting the moment it may finally inflict its terrible agony upon others. Unfortunately for us, we're the first thing it gets to see. The first thing that gets to feel its agony, and as many heads seem endless. When one is cut down, two more rise up from the depths of the water, spewing fire, ice, poison, all kinds of nasty stuff. We have to keep cutting away until the beast loses its strength. Onwards, the Jikuns roost. And in these tunnels, everything is massive and dangerous. Hanging out underneath the Thunder King is quite an effect, and even the smallest of the creatures. The slugs themselves are gigantic and extremely lethal. Not surprising, as the Mogul Flesh Shapers discarded their failed creations in an abyssal shaft beneath Leishan's Keep. The Rick of Decay, it then lured many scavengers to the refuse pits, including the Great Shikun. Ruthless and cunning, the monster's bird devoured the rivals one by one, until it was she who held sole dominion over the shadowy tunnel. Heroes had to fly out to her nest and slay her young before they became a problem. They had to defeat the master of these tunnels. Thousands of years without new playthings. I will enjoy this. Leishen commanded his sorceress to mold an aberration that could peer into the heart of his followers and detect any betrayal. From this decree, the Rumu was given life. The clever entity, it stubbornly obeyed its masters until the Thunder King's death, at which time it disappeared into the citadel's labyrinth corridors. Only recently has the Rumu, all but forgotten by the Mogu, emerged from hiding. The massive ice gaze is quite painful, and the fog hides many secrets. Only by hitting the ants with the right color would they be revealed long enough to be slain. Not to mention that freaky maze that he summons that force teams to maneuver through. I remember it as being quite painful. I welcome the void sex embrace. We will not be forgotten. No, no, no. Deep within the bowels of Leishan's island citadel. Mogu flesh shapers formed the Saurak out of a magical substance of unknown origin. When the citadel was abandoned, some of these experiments languished in the dark pools for far too long. Poor Primordius, he is one of those. Look at the poor Saurak, all alone down here, left forgotten after countless of experiments. This did give him the ability to mutate himself, which is kinda cool I suppose. Depending on the ads that reach him, he'll mutate and obtain new powers. All the same, best to just put it out of its misery. Stop them! The Animus must not be disturbed! During his reign, Leishen labored to build a mechanical servant that would defend his citadel without fear. When his first attempt failed, rage took hold over the Thunder King. He poured his negative emotions into the next and most successful creation, the Dark Animus. To this day, the Ornate Constructs observes his duty, empowered by a mysterious substance at the heart of all mogul flesh shaping experiments. That's what the Dungeon Journal tells us. While the weekly quest, it gives credit to Arc Ritualist Kalada to shape the animus by command of the Thunder King. Either way, our next boss awaits us. You have doomed yourself. It is unleashed. This anima that they used to empower the construct, don't confuse it with the anima that we're gonna collect in the Shadowlands. This stuff is probably the blood of Raden, but we know for sure that it's vital for the flesh shaping and creating of life that Leishan has done. Powerful stuff indeed. So much so that Lord from Blood Elves, they took interest in it. They sent out adventurers to gather this power so they can study it and apply it to their own constructs. We have actually seen this play out in game, as the constructs that are now used by the Blood Elves, they're very much like the Dark Animus one. Now finally, we can get out of the underbelly, out of the sewer, and breathe some fresh air, right into the Iron Quan encounter. Stare into the face of true power! Legends speak of the brutality of Quan and his Quillen champions. The fearless Mogul commander was dubbed Iron Quan by the Thunder King for his unrelenting resolve to claim victory after victory for the Empire, regardless of the cost. Bit of a shame he couldn't claim victory while fighting us. 
After him, we enter the room where they're doing something with the images of the August Celestials. They do play a part in a twin concert encounter. They were actually minigames that you had to win in order to buff and help out the raid. Sadly, I'm all on my own here, so I can't really show you. Either way, the twin consorts, they're said to be the greatest of the Fun the King's treasures, rumored to be the only known female mogul in existence. Lei Shen keeps his trophies close, and their combined arsenal against interlopers even closer. The sun and the moon fight in unison, but the parts about them being the only female mogul in existence, yeah, those really were only rumors. Still, for someone like the Fun the King, I'd imagine they'd be quite a treasure. I can see the light. And after making our way through a very deadly staircase, we finally get to say hello to the man of the hour, Lei Shen, the Thunder King. You, you have earned my ire. I will make an example of you, such that all who look upon my might will tremble and submit. I am Lei Shen, slayer of kings and gods. You have made a grave mistake. The power of the storm, his stolen might from Raden, an Amon fool, it's unleashed upon us. Whereas the Blood Elves, they sought out the Dark Animus to upgrade their forces. On the Alliance side, they asked Majena to take her Staff of Antonidas and drain the remaining power from the Thunder King's Deus. The very powers of the Thunder King now course through the Staff. I might have forgotten, but I don't recall them actually using this for the story later on. Like I said before, we have seen the Blood Elves show up with their new constructs, but I don't actually recall Jaina using the powers of the Staff. Maybe some for the future, maybe I've forgotten. Either way, going over this story, it does make me realize that Lei Shen, he could have been so much more than just a single patch bus. But still, very awesome to see how much backstory they created for him. To read about a titan forge that looked around himself and said, This is not what we're supposed to be like. I'll seek out our creator, I'm going to find the answers, despite everyone believing that this is just it. And when he found Raden, lost and hopeless, he didn't follow him into despair. He decided to carve out his own destiny, thinking to act in the way that his creators would have wanted. This of course led to massive pain and suffering for the people of Pandaria, yet also an empire that rose up and held dominance over the lands. Benevolence is a luxury for the strong, young prince. No great empire was ever built with kindness. I'm not so sure about that. But I can tell you no great empire has ever stood the test of time by crushing its own citizens. Remember, the Mogu were overthrown. That should be the lesson of the Thunder King. It's your move, by the way. I worry you may be too soft to wear your kingdom's crown, Prince Anduin. You would do well to learn some of your father's hardness. Quite the character this Lei Shen. In the Throne of Thunder, it held a little surprise for those that defeated him on Heroic. I sought only to finish the work of the gods. Down the chamber in which we fought Primordius, there is Raden, chained up and hopeless as ever. This twisted world is beyond redemption, beyond the reach of deluded heroes. The only answer to corruption is destruction, and that begins now. And we do the thing that we usually do, we smack some sense into him with a whole lot of violence. He does not believe that we can succeed, but we have earned the right to try. To which he pops off into a little ball of energy and then flies away. From here on out, we would see Garrosh pick up the heart of Yasharaj and the world rising up against him. The Veil of Eternal Blossoms, it was hit hard by rejuvenating the heart, but our efforts, our victory, it gave it a chance to regrow, to rebuild, something that we'll see the results of in the next patch. Eva Raden and the Mogu, they will see their story continued. Potentially, maybe a new allied race. But for now, you're up to speed with the story of Lei Shen and the history of the Mogu. A history that our black dragon friend Refion, he was also really curious about during Mr. Fenaria. At one point, he even asked us to bring him the heart of Lei Shen, which he could then devour. And keep in mind that this was before the release of Warcraft Chronicles, before we knew the fate of the Titans. Oh, we have fallen. We must rebuild the final Titan. 
Do not forget. I really wonder what kind of storyline they had in mind back then. Rebuilding the final titan, most likely Azeroth. Or maybe this is actually still a story waiting to be told. Battle for Azeroth was all about healing the world, not so much about rebuilding it. I wonder what the future might bring. For now though, as always, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time, see ya!